just a minute. I'm going to bust with the white to get it off the screen. Just for a second. Is that better? Up front? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. There we go. The really powerful one is over. How's that? It's also better. Yeah. All right. You're on. Hi, uh, my name's Brandon. I go by Baba Brooks. I'm a third year graduate student at UC Berkeley and Joel Van Hill's lab. I'm going to tell you a little bit today about uh, my research, which deals with the colonization of the GI tract of uh, very low birth weight, very premature infants, uh, and all these infants are housed in a neonatal intensive care unit in Pittsburgh. Uh, Michael Morowitz is our physician collaborator, really great guy. Um, so, first, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the background. Jack actually did a really great job of introducing it. So I won't have to spend too much time there. Then we just finished a pilot study, uh, and I'll go over that data. And then this fall, we're launching a really big study, so I'm hoping to have a lot of conversations with you throughout the conference to, to pick your brain and get your ideas. So uh, look forward to that. So um, a really incredible study came out uh, in 2010, looking at the differences in uh, colonization patterns. In <coughs> so infants are born in two ways, either vaginally or cesarean born. Uh, births and when infants are born, they're born sterile, right? Very little bacteria in their guts. And uh, whether you're born vaginally or through cesarean section, uh, that dictates how you're colonized. So, uh, a lot of the authors in this room uh, and for people I admire, uh, I drew this paper a lot, but uh, the pink there are the, the bacterial community from babies born uh, vaginally, and their community clustered in the red uh, with the vaginal microbes of uh, their mother, which makes sense how birthing happens, right? Uh, alternatively, in the light blue are babies' uh, intestines uh, delivered by cesarean section, and their intestines are primar primarily look like skin microbes. So this is one of the first studies that used molecular technology to show that environmental factors like birthing can influence the trajectory of gut colonization, and that was a really big aha, wow moment, and that was really exciting. Uh, fast forward a year, and there was a study that looked at uh, one infant over a very long period of time, and there were a lot of interesting things that came out of this study. Um, so some big points that I'll point out is this bar chart here shows the, the growing diversity of the infant gut over time. Uh, and you can see in the beginning, um, there are very few phyla, um, mainly because infants are born sterile, and they're gradually uh, acquiring this gut community. And there are certain events in an infant's life like the introduction of, say, solid foods uh, that increase bacterial diversity. And there are other events like uh, the use of antibiotics, which can uh, decrease uh, microbial diversity in these, uh, these infant communities, in the gut communities. Well, in our study, we're looking at infants that are, um, by convention, treated with broad spectrum antibiotics. Low birth weight, low gestation infants, the first week of life, typically physicians give them pretty heavy doses of antibiotics for the first week of life, which largely decouples uh, any influence from the source inocula that was provided during the birthing process. So something to keep in mind with our particular cohort. Um, so we talked about gut microbiology, now a little bit about uh, the NICU and intensive care unit microbiology. The first uh, paper to come out with uh, next-gen sequencing on intensive care units came out last August at the Spanish hospital. Um, and the big experimental variable was they were looking at uh, intensive care units and uh, general hospital environments like the lobby area and things like that in the hallway. And the overall takeaway message here is that hallways have a higher alpha diversity or there are more bacteria found in the hallways, which makes a lot of sense, right? It's higher occupancy. It's not cleaned as regularly as an intensive care unit. Um, they also had a really fancy graph in their paper, uh, but the main take home message here is in, in the hallway you can see a lot of stratification of uh, the different bacterial types indicating there's more diversity in the hallway, uh, and there's also a lot of pink here. And, and the pink, those are enterobacteriaceae uh, or enteric microbes, microbes that are typically found in the feces and really good at colonizing the gut. So it's interesting that there's so much pink or uh, enteric microbes both in the hallway and in the ICU. Feces is everywhere. Um, so there's a, another study that came out early this year uh, that had a lot of interesting findings, but one is the use of source tracker to try to determine, uh, this is a technology that developed by uh, some, some people in this room and co-authors in the paper, but it's a technology that tries to uh, characterize source sync or source, recept source receptor dynamics, um, and you essentially give uh, the software a database of putative source sequences and tries to predict 
why uh, the areas that you're particularly interested in look the way they do. Um, and so in this study, they had, this is a subsection of, of a big figure that they had, but they found that like certain environments like in this NICU, uh, this particular uh, shelving unit right here, it's a heat map style diagram. Uh, it's most likely that the microbes that colonized this area came from human skin. Um, likewise, they had uh, feces and urine and soil, and they found patterns of, of uh, why microbes are in certain areas. And I'm, I'm going to talk about source tracker later, which is why I bring it up now. Um, and lastly, the last paper I'll go over, there was one done in Austria, and essentially they looked at three different types of surfaces in intensive care units. Uh, the green is uh, pores, and they found a lot of soil microbes. Uh, the red are surfaces, and the blues are, are devices. IV uh, dollies and um, different ventilators and things like that. But they essentially found that different environments cluster together based on their ecosystem types. So, so to my experiment and what we've done over the past year, one overarching hypothesis, and that is that frequently touched surfaces um, are likely reservoirs for gut colonists uh, of lower weight nutrients in the NICU. The big questions that we're asking are, first, what microbes are there? followed by, do these communities change over space and time? And lastly, the big big question would be, can we observe migration events from the room uh, into the gut, right? So, uh, we, so this, is a, this is a pilot study. We had a cohort of two infants, uh, and these are their vital signs. The most important things are that they're low birth weight, low gestation, and as you can see, they were given uh, ampicillin and genomycin the, the first week of life. Um, I also have the blueprint layout of the hospital, very similar to the pictures that Jack showed. Uh, it's a private style NICU, so um, there's a central nur nursing station that you can see in the bottom, and then each infant is, has its own little individual pods. So they're somewhat spatially isolated uh, throughout this NICU. And so the sites that we sampled, uh, we sampled on the top there, different surfaces, incubators, um, electronics, the cell phones was a hospital issue cell, hospital issue cell phone that every healthcare provider carried around, and I was particularly interested in those because if you put your you know, iPhone up to your face, there's a lot of sebaceous fluids and things like that. It's the same with these phones, and they weren't cleaned as regularly as you would anticipate in a hospital environment. Um, hands and then sinks and tubes are not shown. Sinks are very similar to the picture that uh, Jack showed. There's sinks in each baby's individual unit, and then tubing was esophageal and tracheal tubing. Uh, and that was variable depending on the infant and their health status. Uh, and then the top left shows a chart of the different indices that we used uh, to sequence on an aluminum line. So our, the techniques that we used are different than a lot of the techniques that will likely be presented here today. We uh, did an amplicon emerge approach, which is essentially instead of using a hypervariable region, uh, we amplify the entire 16S gene. We then uh, fragment it and sequence it on an aluminum line and then reconstruct it with this software called Emerge, uh, which allows you to compare fully sequences uh, sequences as opposed to hypervariable regions, uh, which can oftentimes give you uh, more resolution because you have a longer stretch of DNA to characterize. Uh, and this shows the amount of uh, Emerge sequences that were generated and the number of OTUs um, clustered at the 97%, so we should maybe call them the species, but there's a big debate about that. But the OTUs that were generated is about 12,000 per uh, room there. So now that we have our sequences, we can start to look at the taxonomic classification of these sequences, uh, and we codenamed them Bigsby and Duncan. Those aren't their real names, they're small towns in Oklahoma, which is where I'm from. <laughs> but, um, so I'm showing a lot of these graphs, and the way that they're laid out is the day of life is uh, on the x-axis, so we took samples every third day, so you see in every uh, third day increments, and on the y-axis is relative abundance. Uh, and then each gray area is the module environment from uh, electronics all the way to tubing. And so some general observations, and these are somewhat corroborated from other indoor environment studies. At the phylum level, you have actinobacteria, firmicutes, and proteobacteria largely dominating uh, the room environment, um, which is what was shown on the previous presentation as well. Um, sites that are frequently touched, like you can see the uh, electronics and uh, hand the incubators and the surfaces, they have a, uh, more variation uh, over time, whereas things like faucets and sinks and tubing have um, less variability over time. Um, so stepping down the taxonomic ladder a bit, so as a phylum, this is the family level now, 
Uh, you can learn a little bit more about what's going on. And there's a lot of information here, so I'll point out just a couple of interesting things. I mentioned those cell phones in the um, beige, oops, oops, I think I hit a hot zone there. Yeah. Uh, in the, so in this uh, beige yellow area is the Propionium bacteriaceae, uh, and it turns out there's a lot of Propionium bacterium acnes that hang out on cell phones, which is not too surprising, right? It's a bacteria that uh, makes you get acne during adolescence and things like that. Um, and then there's also a lot of Streptococcaceae uh, in the Kelly Green here on a lot of surfaces, which is uh, not new news. They're commonly found on uh, surface sites. Uh, in the faucets, we have a lot of, in the pink there, a lot of uh, Pseudomonas originosa and a lot of Pseudomonasiae, uh, which is not too surprising. They're really good at forming biofilms and things like that. Uh, but other things is we have these dark brown spikes uh, in a lot of the incubators, uh, a lot of the surface samples. The, start, the dark brown is the Enterobacteriaceae, uh, what I showed in the background info, uh, and what commonly colonize uh, guts, right, which is interesting to find that. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go over uh, Duncan's too much. Uh, it echoes a similar story. Uh, one big difference, though, is that the tubing um, shows categorically different trends, uh, and that's based <coughs> on uh, what's going on in the intestines in the gut. I mean, sorry, what's going on in each infant, um, which is uh, to be expected. So we looked at the phylum level, the family level, and now we're going to look at a uh, species or OTU level classification. And uh, some of you may have seen these, uh, maybe not. But this is an edge weighted spring embedded network plot, and it's kind of hairy and it kind of noisy, but some general trends you can see is that certain environments cluster together. Um, the sinks and the turquoise, they tend to cluster together, uh, whereas things that are commonly touched tend to cluster together. And while um, Unifrac is completely different um, in terms of the way that it, the information is derived on this plot, um, it shows similar trends in that different environments cluster together. But um, what, what I use this graph for was to look at um, specific species and their distribution throughout the samples. So what you can do is you can take the network, you can say what species are only found in the intestines, and then you can say, well, uh, where are these species found throughout the room? And so the white dots represent the OTUs of the species, and the triangles represent each uh, room environment. And you can see that certain species, like this uh, uh, actinomyces species in the bottom here is uh, projected to the periphery of the network, um, meaning that it is not found in any of the room samples and it's only found in fecal samples. But there are other samples that are pulled into the hair of the network, in the very center part of the network, indicating that they're readily available and highly abundant in the environment. And interestingly, um, this one in the very middle of the network uh, is a, a Staph epi, a Staphylococcus epidermidis which is one of the dominant gut taxa in this particular infant's gut. Um, also, Enterococcus fatalis is the second most uh, readily available microbe in this particular data set, um, which is interesting um, because that's, that's the whole hypothesis, is that these microbes are readily available in the environment. Um, oh, lastly, about this slide, uh, OTUs that are asterisked next to the name indicate OTUs that uh, were found in the room before we can detect them in the gut. So it kind of gives you an idea that there's a window of opportunity to be colonized by these microbes uh, in the immediate environment. Um, so I've actually shown the fecal profile over time, but uh, on the top here is Duncan's fecal profile. You can see uh, there's a lot of Enterococcus fecalis, there's a lot of Staph, uh, staph epi colonizing Duncan. Um, and what I'm showing below is I've grayed out all taxa in the room environment that did not colonize this particular infant. And so um, just by visual inspection, you can see that a lot of this pink, like the Pseudomonas originosa, is found in relatively uh, large relative abundances in uh, the sink samples. Um, <coughs> alternatively, a lot of the Enterococcus fecalis and Staph epi uh, are fairly well distributed uh, in the hand samples uh, and in the surfaces samples. Um, and again, the tubing, uh, as I mentioned earlier, tends to reflect uh, what's going on with that. If you look at the other infant, um, one observation is that it's a, it's a categorically different uh, colonization trajectory. 
Uh, Duncan is largely colonized by facultative anaerobes, uh, while Bixby is largely colonized by uh, oligate anaerobe in, in the form of uh, Bacteriordis fragilis. But um, you can still see similar trends in the room samples, uh, largely that, say, for example, this peachy color, uh, the Klebsiella pneumoniae uh, found in the gut uh, is readily found in sink samples. Um, and then you can also see other interesting observations, like this hand sample has a huge spike of uh, E. coli, which colonizes this infant. And that is because the way that we sample the nurses and the physicians, sometimes uh, we get them right after they wash their hands walking into the room. Sometimes we would sample them uh, right after servicing the infant. Um, so uh, this stresses the importance of hand hygiene, right? Uh, the hands can easily disseminate microbes uh, throughout this environment. Um, so last piece of result is we did use Source Tracker, um, and very briefly, using Source Tracker, uh, the probability that the gut was colonized by tubings is really high, uh, but there are other areas as well, like surfaces and electronics, and really most of them show a large probability that the gut was colonized by those uh, putative sources. Um, and, and very simply, with the full-length 16S sequence, we can find identical 16S sequences in the environment before they're detectable in the gut, which is another piece of evidence that perhaps uh, it could be colonized. Um, so very quickly in conclusion, and then I have two more slides on future directions, um, we provided the first full-length 16S uh, survey of hospitals. Um, these hospital environments, uh, each ecosystem tends to cluster together, um, and across each NICU, they uh, have similar um, time signatures in, in terms of variability across time. Uh, both infants, we found large reservoirs of uh, gut colonizers <coughs> in their immediate environments. Um, of these uh, reservoirs, many of them are highly abundant, uh, both in the community and in the gut. Uh, so, that was the pilot, and um, where we're going next, uh, this is going to launch this August. Uh, and this is in collaboration with uh, Bill Nazaroff and SEMA is here as well. But uh, what we're changing on the biotic sampling is we're getting more infants. We're gonna do around 24 infants. We're gonna do daily fecal collection. Uh, we're gonna do uh, room collections Monday through Friday, so we're increasing, uh, getting a finer scale temporal sampling. We're also gonna do uh, a more robust air sampling protocol, uh, trying to collect bioaerosols. Uh, and we're also gonna do di digital PCR, um, which is related to qPCR, and uh, the point there being we're trying to find the absolute amount of uh, sequencing templates that we're, that we're finding in, in these environments, because a lot of these studies are relative, right? You don't know if there's 10 cells on the surface or 100 billion, right? So, um, going to implement that in this next study, and then we'll also have some pending sites if we want to get some information on the mothers and possibly uh, the milk samples that are being fed to infants. Additionally, uh, similar to uh, what was shown in the last presentation, we're going to do uh, real-time collection of uh, particular matter, uh, and the type of information that we'll get, this is uh, the information collected from a classroom in Berkeley. Um, you can see here, uh, unoccupied versus occupied, and in the microbial interesting, the, the fragment that you would expect to contain microbes, uh, you can see that uh, just the presence of occupants picks up a lot of microbes in the room environment. And through this real-time sampling, we'll be able to address um, many different questions about uh, particle transmission and bioaerosol transmission that we couldn't uh, address in the pilot. And so I'm really excited about that. And in particular, if you have uh, any ideas, I'd love to talk to you about it. We're doing a pilot study in a couple of weeks, and then Walnut Creek uh, to test out a lot of these protocols, uh, which I'm really excited about. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Sloan for uh, having me talk, and uh, thank, you, thank you to uh, Bill for uh, collaborating with us, with us in this future project, and Jill, she's been a really great mentor so far. So uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you uh,
Right. So, you know, you don't necessarily know that it's better or worse. You just know that there's an observed pattern. Mm -hmm. True, yeah. Uh, so we do have information these were healthy and they weren't dismissed on, but a lot of these infants end up developing necrotizing enterocolitis or other types of bacterial sepsis and things like that. Um, but you're right, uh, with the full length sequence, I guess you do get, you know, 16S can only resolve down to a certain resolution. You certainly can't tell the difference between strains, right, is what you're getting at. No, I mean, I mean, you don't know who's gonna get sick and who isn't as a consequence of, of oh, the hand hygiene. I mean, you, do, you don't necessarily know that these results that you're seeing mean anything in terms of the health or the outcome. Right, certainly true. Yeah. Um, but I guess the overall perspective was that these microbes are in the environment. So if you do have a particularly pathogenic microbe, uh, understanding how microbes are transmitted uh, is, is good knowledge to know because once you have identified that pathogenic agent, you know that say hands or aerosolized agents, we need to protect against getting that into an immunocompromised infant. So yeah. The, Um, I don't know how regularly they are bathed, but they are bathed by the nurses. They have like sponge type cloths that they use to wipe the infants on a regular basis. I don't know the frequency. And in the tubing, uh, in the feeding, the tubing that we sampled, so that the babies have like toppers that feed uh, innovation tubing, which is a respirator, and then also a esophageal tubing. So a lot of them are fed, I believe, through a food drip that goes through the nasal pharynx down into the stomach. And so a lot of them are fed uh, formula. One of them was fed synthetic formula, and one of them was mother's milk. So, no, yeah. So, given that many of the surfaces in these rooms are, are occupied by the kid vector, or the lab pointer, and the air as well, all the lab how can you differentiate the infant's kid vector from the surfaces or from the air versus the kid pathogen? Yeah. Because the, the overlap. That's, that's a really good question. That's something that we're really wrestling with for the follow-up study. Um, so, so the 16S is gonna tell you much, right? But we're, we're thinking that possibly if you can uh, discriminate by uh, using these PCR probes informed by the metagenomes from the gut, then perhaps you can get uh, genes of unique interest that you could find in each of those from an air sample, the surface sample, and things like that. Um, or possibly they're just ubiquitous. Um, you're not. So I guess the direct answer is I don't think you, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we will be able to discriminate it, but we'll at least have a more likely shot of doing it with these strange specific